Howdy folks. Thanks for joining me this week. We're going to continue our reading of uh, Frankenstein, the original by Mary Shelley. Last week, we started by talking a little bit about the book itself and the, the interesting way it begins with that uh, series of letters written from a sailor who's adventuring his way, trying to find the North Pole, uh, writing back to his sister and at some point his ship gets trapped in the ice and he meets a strange man. Um, and we stopped just at the point where the man begins to tell his story. Um, but for tonight, um, I hope you all are warm. We uh, are getting out of a bit of a cold spell. There were some ice storms here in West Texas the last few days. Today was the first day of sunshine and some of the warmer weather. Um, for myself, tonight I have a brandy. Um, and my pipe, uh, the good English tobacco, this is my preference. Um, I hope y'all had uh, a good week. And, um, if y'all have any comments or questions about the book itself or the way it gets started, I'm always fascinated by how there, there was that thought that a book of fiction needed to be grounded in some reality. So often they they start with some kind of letter or documentation or testament sometimes that sort of proves the authenticity of the story, seemingly to allow the user or the, to allow the reader some some assistance in uh, suspending their belief uh, or disbelief rather. Um, So we'll just take a moment, um, everyone gets settled as we get ready to read what is the first chapter of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, ever, uh, anybody here have anything interesting to drink tonight? Um, or want to talk about maybe a favorite incarnation of the show or of the book, either in stage or film or or television even. Um, I suppose personally my own introduction started when I was a kid watching Abbott and Costello make Frankenstein. And then from there getting into the other universal movies. And uh, I was probably 12 or so when I read the book the first time. It's been a few years since I've read it, but it is good to revisit periodically, I think. Uh, for those who may be interested, actually, before I, I sort of forgot to talk about this last week, but um, before the reading started, uh, we played um, the first ever movie of Frankenstein, which was a Thomas Edison film, uh, silent picture. And uh, it's pretty remarkable to see what they thought, you know, and what they were trying to convey. Um, the monster's pretty grotesque, nothing like what we might think of today, of course. Um, so I'll set this aside. And, um, <clears throat> we can, uh, chapter one. I am by birth a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My ancestors have been for many years counselors and syndics, and my father had filled several public situations with honor and reputation. He was respected by all who knew him for his integrity and indefatigable attention to public business. He passed his younger days perpetually occupied by the affairs of his country. And it was not until the decline of life that he thought of marrying and bestowing on the state sons who might carry his virtues and his name down to posterity. As the circumstances of his marriage illustrate his character, I cannot refrain from relating them. One of his most intimate friends was a merchant who, from a flourishing state, fell, through numerous 
mischances into poverty. This man, whose name was Beaufort, Beaufort, was a proud and unbending disposition and could not bear to live in poverty and oblivion in the same country where he had formerly been distinguished for his rank and magnificence. Having paid his debts, therefore, in the most honorable manner, he retreated with his daughter to the town of Lucerne, where he lived unknown and in wretchedness. My father loved Beaufort with the truest friendship and was deeply grieved by his retreat in these unfortunate circumstances. He grieved also for the loss of his society and resolved to seek him out and endeavor to persuade him to begin the world again through his credit and assistance. Beaufort had taken effectual measures to conceal himself, and it was ten months before my father discovered his abode. Overjoyed at this discovery, he hastened to the house, which was situated in a mean street near Rose. But when he entered, misery and despair alone welcomed him. Beaufort was saved but a very small sum of money from the wreck of his fortunes. But it was sufficient to provide him with some sustenance for some months, and in the meantime, he hoped to procure some respectable employment in a merchant's house. The interval was consequently spent in action. His grief only became more deep and rankling. When he had leisure for reflection, and at length, it took so fast hold of his mind that at the end of three months, he lay on a bed of sickness, incapable of any exertion. His daughter attended him with the greatest tenderness, but she saw with despair that their little fund was rapidly decreasing and that there was no other prospect for support. But Carolyn Beaufort possessed a mind of an uncommon mold and her courage rose to support her in her, in her adversity. She procured plain work, she plaited straw, and by various means contrived to earn a little pittance scarcely sufficient to support life. Several months passed in this manner. Her father grew worse. Her time was more entirely occupied in attending him. Her means of substance decreased. And in the, ten month, the tenth month, her father died in her arms, leaving her an orphan and a beggar. This last blow overcame her, and she knelt by Beaufort's coffin, weeping bitterly when my father entered the chamber. He came like a protecting spirit to the girl who committed herself to his care, and after the internment of his friend, he conducted her to Geneva and placed her under the protection of, the, of a relation. Two years after this event, Caroline became his wife. When my father became a husband and a parent, he found his time so occupied by the duties of his new situation that he relinquished many of his public employments and devoted himself to the education of his children. Of these, I was the eldest and destined successor to all his labors and utility. No creature could have been more tender parents than mine. My improvement in health or their constant care, especially as I remained for several years their only child. But before I continue my narrative, I must record an incident which took place when I was four years of age. My father's sister, whom he tenderly loved, and who he had married early in life, and who had married early in life an Italian gentleman. Soon after her marriage, she had accompanied her husband to, to his native country, and for some years my father had very little communication with her. About the time I mentioned, she died, and a few months afterwards he received a letter from her husband, acquainting him with his intention of marrying an Italian lady, and requesting my father to take charge of the infant Elizabeth, the only child of his deceased sister. It is my wish, he said, that you should consider her as your own daughter 
and educate her thus. Her mother's fortune is secured to her, the documents of which I will commit to your keeping. Reflect upon this proposition and decide whether you would prefer educating your niece yourself to her being brought up by a stepmother. My father did not hesitate and immediately went to Italy that he might accompany little Elizabeth to her future home. I have often heard my mother say that she was at that time the most beautiful child she had ever seen and showed signs even then of a gentle and affectionate disposition. These indications and a desire to bind as closely as possible the ties of domestic love determined my mother to consider Elizabeth as my future wife, a design which she never found reason to repent. From this time, Elizabeth Lavenza became my playfellow and, as we grew older, my friend. She was docile and good-tempered, yet gay and playful as a summer insect. Although she was lively and animated, her feelings were strong and deep, and her disposition uncommonly affectionate. No one could better enjoy liberty, yet no one could submit with more grace than she did to constraint and caprice. Her imagination was luxuriant, yet her capability of, a, of application was great. Her person was the image of her mind, her hazel eyes, although as lively as a bird's, possessed an attractive softness. Her figure was light and airy, and though capable of enduring great fatigue, she appeared the most fragile creature in the world. While I admire her understanding and fancy, I love to attend on her as I should on a favorite animal, and never saw so much grace both of person and of mind united to so little pretension. Everyone adored Elizabeth. If the servants had any request to make, it was always through her intercession. We were strangers to any species of disunion and dispute. For although there was great dissimilitude in our characters, there was a harmony in that very dissimilitude. I was more calm and more philosophical than my companion, yet my temper was not so yielding. My application was of longer endurance, but it was not so severe whilst it endured. I delighted in investigating the facts relative to the actual world. She busied herself in following the aerial creations of the poets. The world was to me a secret, which I desired to discover. To her, it was a vacancy, which she thought to, which she sought to people with imaginations of her own. My brothers were considerably younger than myself, but I had a friend in one of my schoolfellows who compensated for this deficiency. Henry Clareville was the son of a merchant of Geneva, an intimate friend of my father. He was a boy of singular talent and fancy. I remember when he was nine years old, he wrote a fairy tale, which was the delight and amazement of all his companions. His favorite study consisted in books of chivalry and romance. And when very young, I can remember that we used to act plays composed by him out of these favorite books, the principal characters of which were Orlando, Robin Hood, and St. George. No youth could have passed more happily than mine. My parents were indulgent and my companions amiable. Our studies were never forced and by some means we always had an end placed in view, which excited us to our door in, our, in the prosecution of them. It was by this method and not by emulation that we were urged to application. Elizabeth was not enticed to apply herself to drawing that her companions might not outstrip her, but through the desire of pleasing her aunt by the representation of some favorite scene done by her own hand. 
we learned Latin and English that we might read the writings in those languages. And so far from studying being made odious to us through punishment, we loved application. And our amusements would have been the labors of other children. Perhaps we did not read so many books or learn languages so quickly as those who are disciplined according to the ordinary methods. But what we learned was impressed more deeply in our memories. In this description of our domestic circle, I include Henry Clerval, for he was constantly with us. He went to school with me and generally passed the afternoon at our house for being an only child and destitute of companions at home. His father was pleased that he should find associates at our house and we were never completely happy when Clerval was absent. I feel pleasure in dwelling on the recollections of childhood before misfortune had tainted my mind and changed its bright visions of expensive usefulness into gloomy and narrow reflections upon self. But in drawing the picture of my early days, I must not omit to record those events which led by insensible steps to my, af to my aftertale of misery for when I would account to myself for the birth of that passion, which afterwards ruled my destiny, I find it arise like a mountain river from ignoble and almost forgotten sources, but swelling as it proceeded, it became the torrent which in its course has swept away all my hopes and joys. <laughs> Natural philosophy is the genius that regulated my fate. I desire, therefore, in this narration, to state those facts which led to my predilection for that science. When I was 13 years of age, we all went on a party of pleasure to the baths near Thonon. The inclemency of the weather obliged us to remain a day confined to the inn. In this house, I chanced to find a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa. I opened it with apathy, the theory which he attempts to demonstrate and the wonderful facts which he relates soon changed this feeling into enthusiasm. A new light seemed to dawn upon my mind and bounding with joy, I communicated my discovery to my father. I cannot help remarking here the many opportunities instructors possess for directing the attention of their pupils to useful knowledge, which they utterly neglect. My father looked carelessly at the title page of my book and said, Ah, Cornelius Agrippa, my dear Victor, do not waste your time upon this. It is sad trash. <clears throat> Instead of this remark, my father had taken the pains to explain to me the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded, and that a modern system of science had been introduced, which possessed much greater powers than the ancient, because the powers of the latter were chimerical, while those of the former were real and practical. Under such circumstances, I should certainly have thrown a grip aside, and with my imagination warmed as it was, should probably have applied myself to the more rational theory of chemistry, which has resulted from modern discoveries. It is even possible that the train of my ideas would never have received the fatal impulse that led me to my ruin. But the cursory glance my father had taken of my volume by no means assured me that he was acquainted with its contents, and I continued to read the greatest avidity. When I returned home, my first care was to procure the whole works of this author, and afterwards, Paracelsus and Albert Magnus, Magnus. I read and studied the wild fancies of these writers with delight. They appeared to me treasures known to few beside myself. And although I often wished to communicate these secret stores of knowledge to my father, Yet, those 
indefinite censure of my favorite Agrippa always withheld me. I disclosed my discoveries to Elizabeth, therefore, under the promise of strict secrecy. But she did not interest herself in the subject, and I was left by her to pursue my studies alone. It may appear very strange that a disciple of Albertus Magnus should arise in the 18th century, but our family was not scientifical, and I had not attended any of the lectures given at the schools of Geneva. My dreams were therefore undisturbed by reality, and I entered with the greatest diligence into the search of the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Life. But the latter obtained my most undivided attention. Wealth was an inferior object. But what glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame and render man invulnerable to any but violent death? Nor were these my only visions. The raising of ghosts or devils was a promise liberally accorded by my favorite authors, the fulfillment of which I most eagerly sought. And if my incantation, incantations were always unsuccessful, I attributed the failure rather to my own inexperienced mistake than to a want of skill or fidelity in my instructors. The natural phenomenon which take place every day before our eyes did not escape examinations. Distillation and the wonderful effects of steam, processes of which my favorite authors were utterly ignorant, excited my astonishment. But my utmost wonder was engaged by some experiments on an air pump, which I saw employed by gentlemen who we were in the habit of visiting. The ignorance of the early philosophers on these and several other points served to decrease their credit with me, but I could not entirely throw them aside before some other system should occupy their place in my mind. When I was about 15 years old, we had retired to our house near Belriv when we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. It advanced from behind the mountains of Jura, and the thunder burst at once with frightful loudness from various quarters of the heavens. I remained while the storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity and delight. As I stood at the door, which stood about 20 yards, sorry, as I stood at the door, on a sudden I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak which stood about 20 years from our house. And so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When we visited it the next morning, we found the tree shattered in a singular manner. It was not splintered by the shock, but entirely reduced to thin ribbons of wood. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. The catastrophe of this tree excited my extreme astonishment, and I eagerly inquired of my father the nature and origin of thunder and lightning. He replied, electricity, describing at the same time the various effects of that power. He constructed a small electrical machine and exhibited a few experiments he made also a kite with wire and string, which drew down that fluid from the clouds. This last stroke completed the overthrow of Cornelius Agrippa, Albertus Magnus, and Paracelsus, who had so long reigned the lords of my imagination. But by some fatality, I did not feel inclined to commence the study of any modern system. And this disinclination was influenced by the following circumstance. My father expressed a wish that I should attend a course of lectures upon natural philosophy, to which I cheerfully consented. Some accident prevented my attending these lectures until the course was nearly finished. The lecture, being, for, being therefore one of the last, was entirely incomprehensible to me. 
the professor discoursed with the greatest fluency of, fluency of potassium and boron, of sulfates and oxides, terms which I can affix no idea. And I became disgusted with the science of natural philosophy, although I still read Pliny and Buffum with delight authors in my estimation of nearly equal interest and utility. My occupations at this age were principally the mathematics, and most of the branches of study appertaining to science. I was busily employed in learning languages. Latin was already familiar to me, and I began to read some of the easiest Greek authors without the help of a lexicon. I also perfectly understood English and German. This is the list of my accomplishments at the age of 17, and you may conceive that my hours were fully employed in acquiring and maintaining a knowledge of various of this various liter literature. Another task also developed upon me when I became the instructor of my brothers. Ernest was six years younger than myself and was my principal pupil. He had been afflicted with ill health from his infancy, through which Elizabeth and I had been his constant nurses. His disposition was gentle, but he was incapable of any severe application. William, the youngest of our family, was yet an infant and the most beautiful little fellow in the world. His lively blue eyes, dimpled cheeks, and endearing manners inspired the tenderest affection. Such was our domestic circle from which care and pain seemed forever banished. My father directed our studies and my mother partook of our enjoyments. Neither of us possessed the slightest preeminence over the other. The voice of command was never heard against us, but mutual affection engaged us all to comply with and obey the slightest desire of each other. Chapter two. When I had attained the age of 17, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. I had hitherto attended the schools of Geneva, but my father thought it necessary for the completion of my education that I should be made acquainted with other customs than those of my native country. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date. But before the day resolved upon the sorry, before the date resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred. An omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught scarlet fever, but her illness was not severe and she quickly recovered. During her confinement, many arguments had been urged to persuade my mother to refrain from attending upon her. She had at first yielded to her entreaties, but when she heard that her favorite was recovering, she could no longer debar herself from her society and entered upon her chamber long before the danger of infection was passed. The consequences of this imprudence were fatal. On the third day, my mother sickened. Her fever was very malignant, and the looks of her attendant prognosticated the worst event. On her deathbed, the fortitude of this admir admirable woman did not desert her. She joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself. Children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. Elizabeth, my love, you must supply my place to your younger cousins. Alas, I regret that I am taken from you and happy and beloved as I have been. It is not hard to quit you all, but these are not thoughts befitting me. I will endeavor to resign myself cheerfully to death. I will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly. 
and her countenance expressed affection, even in death. I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that most irreparable evil, the void that presents itself to the soul, and the despair that is exhibited on the countenance. It is so long before the mind can persuade itself that she, whom we saw every day, and whose very existence appeared to be a part of our own, can have departed forever. But the brightness of a beloved eye can have been extinguished, and the sound of a voice so familiar and dear to the ear can be hushed, never more to be heard. These are the reflections of the first days. But when the lapse of time proves the reality of the evil, then the actual bitterness of grief commences. Yet from whom has not that rude hand rent away some dear connection? And why should I describe a sorrow which all have felt and must feel? The time at length arrives when grief is rather an indulgence than a necessity. And the smile that plays upon the lips, although it may be deemed a sacrilege, is not banished. My mother was dead. But we had still duties we ought to perform. We must continue our course with the rest and learn to think ourselves fortunate whilst one remains whom the spoiler has not seized. My journey to Ingolstadt, which had been deferred by these events, was now again determined upon. I obtained from my father a respite of some weeks, or sorry, a respite of some weeks, this period was spent sadly. My mother's death and my speedy departure decreased our spirits. But Elizabeth endeavored to renew the spirit of cheerfulness in our little society. Since the death of her aunt, her mind had acquired new firmness and vigor. She determined to fulfill her duties with the greatest exactness. And she felt that the most imperious duty of rendering her uncle and cousins happy had devolved upon her. She consoled me, amused her uncle, instructed my brothers, and I never beheld her so enchanting as at this time, when she, when she was continually endeavoring to contribute to the happiness of others, entirely forgetful of herself. The day of my departure arrived at length. I had taken leave of all my friends, except in Clairville, who spent the last evening with us. He bitterly lamented that he was unable to accompany me, but his father could not be persuaded to part with him, intending that he should become a partner with him in business, in compliance with his favorite theory. That learning was superfluous in the commerce of early ordinary life. Henry had a refined mind. He had no desire to be idle and was well pleased to become his father's partner. But he believed that a man might be a very good trader and yet possess a cultivated understanding. While we sat late, listening to his complaints and making many little arrangements for the future. The next morning, early, I departed. Tears gushed from the eyes of Elizabeth. They proceeded partly from sorrow at my departure and partly because she reflected that the same journey was to have taken place three months before when a mother's blessing accompanied me. I threw myself into the chase that was to convey me away and indulge in the most melancholy reflections. I who had ever been surrounded by amiable companions, continually engaged in endeavoring to bestow mutual pleasure. I was now alone. In the university, whither I was going, I must form my own friends and be my own protector. My life had hitherto been remarkable, secluded, and domestic. And this had given me invincible repugnance to new countenances. I loved my brothers, Elizabeth and Clarabel. These were 
old familiar faces, but I believe myself totally unfitted for the company of strangers. Such were my reflections as I commenced my journey. But as I proceeded, my spirits and hopes rose. I ardently desired the acquisition of knowledge. I had often, when at home, thought it hard to remain during my youth cooped up in one place and had longed to enter the world and take my station among other human beings. Now my desires were complied with and it would indeed have been folly to repent. I had sufficient leisure for these and many other reflections during my journey to Ingolstadt, which was long and fatiguing. At length, the high white steeple of the town met my eyes. I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment to spend the evening as I pleased. The next morning I deliver, delivered my letters of introduction and paid a visit to some of the principal professors. And among others, to M. Crump, professional, the professor of natural philosophy. He received me with politeness and asked me several questions concerning my progress in the different branches of science appertaining to natural philosophy. I mentioned, it is true, with fear and trembling, the only authors I'd ever read upon those subjects. The professor stared. Have you, he said, really spent your time in studying such nonsense? I replied in the affirmative. Every minute, continued M. Crimp, with warmth, every instant that you have wasted on those books is utterly and entirely lost. You have burdened your memory with exploded systems and useless names. Good God, in what desert land have you lived? where no one was kind enough to inform you that these fancies, which you have so greedily imbibed, are a thousand years old and as musty as they are ancient. I little expected in this enlightened and scientific age to find a disciple of Albertus Magnus and Paracelsus. My dear sir, you must begin your studies entirely anew. So saying, he stepped aside and wrote down a list of books treating of natural philosophy, which he desired me to procure, and dismissed me after mentioning that in the beginning of the following week, he intended to commence a course of lectures upon natural philosophy in its general relations, and that M. Waldman, a fellow professor, would lecture upon chemistry the alternate days that he missed. I returned home, not disappointed, for I had long considered those authors useless, whom the professor had so strongly reprobated. But I did not feel much inclined to study the books which I procured at his recommendation. Krempt was a squat, was a little squat man with a gruff voice and a repulsive countenance. The teacher, therefore, did not prepossess me in favor of his doctrine. Besides, I had a contempt for the uses of modern net philosophy is very different when the masters of science sought immortality and power. Such views, although futile, were grand, but now the scene was changed. The ambition of the inquirer seemed to limit itself to the annihilation of those visions on which my interest in science was chiefly founded. I was required to exchange chimeras of boundless grandeur for realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during the first two or three days spent almost in solitude. But as the ensuing week commenced, I thought of the information which M. Krim, uh, had given me concerning the lectures. And although I could not consent to go and hear that little conceited fellow deliver sentences out of a pulpit, I recollected what he said of M. Waldman, whom I had never seen as he had hitherto been out of town. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, I went into the lecturing room, which M. Waldman entered shortly after. This professor was very unlike his colleague. <clears throat> 
he appeared about 50 years of age, but with an aspect expressive of the greatest benevolence. A few gray hairs covered his temples, but those at the back of his head were nearly black. His person was short, but remarkably erect, and his voice, the sweetest I had ever heard. He began his lecture by a recapitulation of the history of chemistry and the various improvements made by different men of learning, pronouncing the fervor with fervor the names of the most distinguished discoverers. He then took a cursory view of the present state of the science and explained many of its elementary terms. After having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a, with a panegyric, sorry, uh, um, he concluded with the terms of which I will never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters perform very little. They know that metals cannot be transmuted and that the elixir of life is a chimera. But these philosophers, whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt, and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and shew how she works in their hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have discovered how the blood circulates and the nature of the air we breathe. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. <laughs> I departed highly pleased with the professor and his lecture and paid him a visit the same evening. His manners in private were even more mild and attractive than in public, for there was a certain dignity in his mien during his lesson, which his own house, which in his own house was replaced by the greatest affectionate affability and kindness. He heard with attention my little narrative concerning my studies and smiled at the names of Cornelius Agrippa and Paracelsus, but without the contempt that uh, that M. Kremp had exhibited, he said, these were men to whose indefatigable zeal modern philosophers were indebted for most of the foundations of their knowledge. They had left to us an easier task to give new names and arrange in connected classifications, the facts which they in a great degree had been the instruments of bringing to light. The labors of men of genius, however, erroneous, however erroneously directed, scarcely ever fail in ultimately turning to the solid advantage of time. I listened to the statement which delivered without any presumption or affection, and then add, this lecture had removed my prejudices against modern chemists, and I, at the same time, requested his advice concerning the books I sought to procure. I am happy, said M. Waldman, to have gained your disciple. And if your application equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success. Chemistry is that branch of natural philosophy in which the greatest improvements have been and may be made. It is on that account that I have made it my peculiar study. But at the same time, I have not neglected the other branches of science. A man would make a very sorry chemist if he attended to that department of human knowledge alone. If your wish is to become really a man of science and not merely a petty experimentalist, I should advise you to apply every branch of natural philosophy, including mathematics. He then took me into his laboratory and explained to me the uses of his various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure and promising me the use of his own. 
when I should have advanced far enough in the science not to derange their mechanism. He also gave me the list of books which I had requested, and I took my leave. Thus ended a day memorable to me. It decided my future destiny. Chapter 3. From this day, natural philosophy, and particularly chemistry, in the most comprehensive sense of the term, became nearly my sole occupation. I read with ardor those works, so full of genius and discrimination, which modern inquirers have written on these subjects. I attended the lectures and cultivated the acquaintance of the men of science of the university. And I found even in M. Krem a great deal of sound sense and real information combined, it is true, in repulsive physiognomated manners, but not on that account the less valuable. In M. Waldman, I found a true friend. His greatness was never tinged by dogmatism, and his instructions were given with an air of frankness and good nature that banished every idea of pedantry. It was perhaps the amiable character of this man that inclined me more to that branch of natural philosophy than which he professed, than an intrinsic love for the, an intrinsic love for the science itself. But this state of mind had place only in the first steps towards knowledge. The more fully I entered into the science, the more exclusively I pursued it for its own sake. That application, which at first had been a matter of duty and resolution, now became so ardent and eager that the stars often disappeared in the light of the morning whilst I was yet engaged in my laboratory. As I applied so closely, it may be easily conceived that I improved rapidly. My ardor was indeed the astonishment of the students and my proficiency and that of my masters. Professor Kremp often asked me with a sly smile how Cornelius Agrippa went on, whilst M. Waldman expressed the most heartfelt exultation in my progress. Two years passed in this manner, during which I paid no visit to Geneva, but was engaged, heart and soul, in the pursuit of some discoveries which I hoped to make. None but those who have experienced them, them can conceive of the enticements of science. In other studies, you go as far as others have gone before you, and there is nothing more to know. But in a scientific pursuit, there is a continual food for discovery and wonder. A mind of moderate capacity, which closely pursues one study, must infallibly arrive at great proficiency in that study. And I, who continually saw the attainment of one object of pursuit and was solely wrapped up in this, improved so rapidly that at the end of two years, I made some discoveries in the improvement of some chemical instruments, which procured me great esteem and admiration at the university. When I arrived at this point and had become as well acquainted with the theory and practice of natural philosophy as depended upon the lessons of the professors at Ingolstadt, my residence there being no longer conducive to my improvements, I thought of returning to my friends in my native town when an incident happened, when an incident happened that protracted my stay. One of the phenomena which had peculiarly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and indeed any animal ended endued with life. Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one which has ever been considered a mystery. 
Yet with how many things are we upon the brink of becoming acquainted, if cowardice or carelessness did not restrain our inquiries? I revolved these circumstances in my mind and determined thenceforth to apply myself more particularly to those branches of natural philosophy which relate to physiology. Unless I had been animated by an almost supernatural enthusiasm, my application to the study would have been irksome and almost intolerable. To examine the causes of life, we must first have recourse to death. I became acquaintance, acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. In my education, my father had taken the greatest precautions that my mind should be impressed with those supernatural horrors. I do not ever remember to have trembled at a tale of superstition or to have feared the apparition of a spirit. Darkness had no effect upon, upon my fancy. In the churchyard was to me, to me merely the receptacle of bodies deprived of life, which, from being the seat of beauty and strength, had become food for the worm. Now I was led to examine the cause and progress of this decay and forced to spend days and nights in vaults and charnel houses. My attention was fixed upon every object, the most insupportable to the delicacy of the human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeeded to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain. I paused, examining and analyzing all the minutia of causation as exemplified in the change from life to death and death to life until from the midst of this darkness, a light suddenly broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous yet so simple that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illustrated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries toward the same science that I alone should have reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. Remember, I am not recording the vision of a madman. The sun does not more certainly shine in the heavens than that which I now affirm is true. Some miracle might have produced it. Yet the stages of discovery were distinct and probable. After days and nights of incredible labor and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause of generation and life. Nay more, I became myself capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. The astonishment which I had first experienced on this discovery soon gave place to delight and rapture. After so much time spent in the painful labor to arrive at once at the summit of my desires was the most gratifying consummation of my toils. But this discovery was so great and overwhelming that all the steps by which I had progressively led to it were obliterated, and I beheld only the result. What had been the study and desire of the wisest men of science since the creation of the world was now within my grasp. Not that the magic scene, it all opened upon me once. The information I obtained was of a nature rather to do it my endeavor so soon as I point them towards the object of my search and to exhibit that object already accomplished. I was like a Arian who had been buried with the dead and found a passage to life aided only by one glimmering and seemingly ineffectual light. I see by your eagerness and the wonder and the hope which your eyes express, my friend, that you expect to be informed of the secret with which I am acquainted. That cannot be.
Listen patiently until the end of my story, and you will easily perceive why I am reserved upon the subject. I will not lead you on, unguarded and ardent as I was then, to your destruction and, and infallible misery. Learn from me, if not by my precepts, at least by my example. How dangerous is the acquisition of the, is the acquirement of knowledge? And how much happier that man is who believes his native town to be the world, and he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. When I found so astonishing a power placed in my hands, I hesitated a long time concerning the matter in which I should employ it. Although I possess the capacity of bestowing animation, yet to prepare a frame for the reception of it, with all its intricacies and fibers, muscles and veins, still remained a work of inconceivable difficulty and labor. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself or one of simple organization but my imagination was too exalted by my first success to permit me to doubt of my ability to give life to an animal as complex and wonderful as a man. The materials at present within my command hardly appeared adequate to so arduous an undertaking. But I doubted not that I should ultimately succeed. I prepared myself for a multitude of reverses my operations might be incessantly baffled, and at last my work might be imperfect. Yet, when I consider the improvement, which every day takes place in science and mechanics, I was encouraged to hope my present attempts would at least lay the foundations of future success. Nor could I consider the magnitude and complexity of my plan as any argument of its impracticality. It was with these feelings that I began the creation of a human being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary to my first intention, to make the being of a gigantic structure, that is to say, about eight feet in height and proportionately large. After having formed this determination, and having spent some months in successfully collecting and arranging my materials, I began. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards, like a hurricane, in the first enthusiasm of success. Life and death appeared to me ideal bonds, which I should first break through and pour a torrent of light into our, door, into our dark world. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. Pursuing these reflections, I thought that if I could bestow animation upon life this matter, I might in process of time, although I now found it impossible, renew life where death had apparently devoted the body to corruption. <laughs> These thoughts supported my spirits, which I pursued my undertaking with unremitting ardor. My cheek had grown pale with study, and my person I become emaciated with confinement. Sometimes, on the very brink of certainty, I failed. Yet still, I clung to the hope which the next day or the next hour might realize. One secret which I alone possessed was the hope to which I had dedicated myself. And the moon gazed upon my midnight labors while, with unrelaxed and breathless eagerness, I pursued the nature to the, her hiding place. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the hallowed damps of the grave 
or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay. My limbs now tremble and my eyes swim with remembrance. But then arrested, a resistless and almost frantic impulse urged me forward. I seemed to have lost all soul or sensation but for this one pursuit. It was indeed a passing trance that only made me feel with renewed acuteness so soon as the unnatural stimulus ceasing to operate. I had returned to my old habits. I collected bones from charnel houses and disturbed with profane fingers the tremendous secrets of the human frame. In a solitary chamber, or rather cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all other apartments by a gallery and staircase, I kept my workshop of filthy creation. My eyeballs were staring from their sockets and attending to the detail of my employment. The dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials, and often did my human nature turn with loathing for my occupation whilst still urged on by the eagerness which I perpetually increased. I brought my work near to a conclusion. The summer months passed while I was thus engaged, heart and soul, in one pursuit. It was a most beautiful season. Never did the fields bestow a more plentiful harvest, or vines yield a more luxuriant vintage. But my eyes were insensible to the charms of nature, and the, feel, and the same feelings which made me neglect the scenes around me caused me also to forget those friends who were so many miles absent, and whom I had not seen for a long time. I knew my silence disquieted them, and I well remember the words of my father. I know that while you are pleased with yourself, you think us and you, you will think of us with affection and we shall hear regularly from you. You must pardon me if I regard any interruption in your correspondence as a proof that your other duties are equally neglected. I knew well, therefore, what would be my father's feelings but I could not tear my thoughts of my employment, loathsome in itself, but which had taken irresistible hold of my imagination. I wished, as it were, to procrastinate all that related to my feelings of affection until the great object, which swallowed up every habit of my nature, should be completed. I then thought that my father would be unjust if he ascribed my neglect to vice or faultiness on my part. But I am now convinced that he was justified in conceiving that I should not be altogether free from blame. A human being in perfection ought always to preserve a calm and peaceful mind, and never to allow passion or transitory desire to disturb his tranquility. I do not think that the pursuit of knowledge is an exception to this rule. If the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your affections and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy can possibly mix, then that study is certainly unlawful, that is to say, not befitting the human mind. If this rule were always observed, if no man allowed any pursuit whatsoever to interfere with the tranquility of his domestic affections, Greece had not been enslaved, Caesar would have spared his country, America would have been discovered more gradually, and the empires of Mexico and Peru had not been destroyed. But I forget that I am moralizing in the most interesting part of my tale, and your look reminds me to proceed. My father made no reproach in his letter, and only took notice of my silence by inquiring into my occupations more patiently than before. Winter, spring, and summer passed away during my labors, but I did not watch the blossom or expanding leaves. 
sight which sights which before always yielded me supreme delight. So deeply was I engrossed in my occupation. The leaves of that year had withered before my work drew near a close, and now every day showed me more plainly how well I had succeeded. But my enthusiasm was checked by my anxiety, and I appeared rather like one doomed by slavery to toil in the mines or any other unwholesome trade than an artist occupied by his favorite employment. Every night I was oppressed by a slow fever, and I became nervous to a most painful degree, a disease that I regretted the more because I had hitherto enjoyed more most excellent health, and had always boasted of the firmness of my nerves. But I believed that exercise and amusement would soon drive away such symptoms, and I promised myself both of these when my creation should be complete. That's the end of chapter three. Um, I think that uh, we will stop there for tonight. And I hope next week that you will join me for continuing the read with chapter four. Um, I, I think it's really interesting. Um, I think it's really interesting that he's uh, sort of homeschooled. I think it's interesting that he followed his own passions. I think uh, I like that, you know, he was enamored with these older studies that he thought were current. And even when they had been even when it was explained to him that they were dispelled, it took an actual demonstration for him to finally believe it. But even then, he doesn't seem quite willing to let go of, of their goals. I like uh, in this, too, that he's revealing a lot without saying it directly. You know, he's the way he talks about what he'd read those ideas had already taken hold about, you know, the elixir of life and that sort of thing. And so even though he realized that their science was gone or not really science, uh, but that it's been dismissed, that idea has still taken such hold even before his mother's death. So his mother's death just sort of solidifies it. Um, and, uh, I think it's I think it's really interesting that so much attention is paid to the philosophers that he was reading. I also think it's really interesting that they keep referring to it as natural philosophy. Um, I like I like seeing the way uh, science was thought of then. It was it, it totally different, you know, two hundred years ago uh, to what it is today. It's pretty remarkable to think. Um, how far we've come in that regard. And it's interesting the way lectures are described and the way the university is described. Um, it's also really interesting, too, that he... Um, he's, he's already showing some disgust with the work that he's doing, and yet he can't stop himself. And he's dismissing his own feelings and he's dismissing his father's warnings because he's just so, uh, so enthralled. I think it's also interesting that considering how wordy the beginning was, this part seems almost a little fast, but of course, um, the focus was on, on what happens after the creature is created, not necessarily before. Um, what's the other, back for a moment, what was 
Let's say, uh, um, I thought it was really funny too when he does get to the university. What does he say about that professor? Um, So, I, like, I understand it, it's funny that the way the professor is derisive um, about the the, the self guided study, uh, but that he goes that you know that that uh, Victor goes right for um, uh, Kremp was a squat little man with a gruff voice and a repulsive countenance. The teacher therefore did not prepossess me in favor of his doctrine. So it's funny, it's not, it's not necessarily that he was a jerk, but just, yeah, he looks a little terrible. So I didn't feel like I had to listen to him. And then he goes on to so compliment the other professor as his appearance lent himself towards being a good teacher. I don't know if there's something, something telling there. And um, I also thought it was interesting when he's talking about Elizabeth, his own feelings of love, he talks about how wonderful his childhood is and he had all these companions and they were so amiable. But it, you can see he's, at least I feel, he seems somewhat uh, disassociated, I don't know, from his feelings. Uh, How does he say it about Elizabeth? Um, you know, he says he should love, he, he loved to tend on her as I should on a favorite animal. And at one point he compares her to a summer insect. Uh, so he just always has this sort of detached observance and, uh, I thought that was interesting. So, um, I think for now, uh, I'll, I'll keep looking after this. Maybe next week we can talk a little more about what happened uh, and what I read tonight. Um, next Thursday at 8.30, we'll do a little bit of a recap, maybe maybe talk a little bit about some of the science more, because I'm fascinated by that. I actually want to, there's some of this that I want to look into myself. Um, it's been a while since I've read, um, but in the meanwhile, I think we'll plan on just being back here, Hearthside, 8.30 next week, Thursday. Um, for those that are watching on Twitch, um, there is somebody reading Robert Frost, and I think uh, you'll be dumped there after we say farewell. So with that, it's uh, Mr. Magpie is reading Robert Frost. So I hope you all enjoy that. And for now, I want to say thank you very kindly for stopping by. And I sure hope to see you all next week. Take care.